If you're building in the blockchain space, then I want you to know about a company called Blockset. I've been speaking with their team closely and have no doubt that they are going to enable the next wave of developers and business leaders to build amazing applications. Blockset offers accessible data from all major chains through easy to use APIs. It acts as your hosted blockchain infrastructure and it ultimately enables high quality apps to be built at a fraction of the cost in a fraction of the time. Go sign up for a free account at blockset.com and start building today. Stay tuned for more information later in this episode. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to what is a very special episode of The Scoop. We are joined by CEO of Genesis Global Trading, Michael Morrow, and I have my colleague Ryan Todd with me. This is Michael's second appearance on the show. He was an early adopter of The Scoop coming on back in May 2019. We're very excited to have him on again to talk about some of the things he's seeing in the OTC world, as well as the lending space, given the fact that Genesis Global Trading also operates a lending unit, Genesis Capital. So Michael, thanks for coming on the show. How are you managing during these trying times? Hi guys, uh, it's good to uh, good to be back with everybody. Um, I hope everyone's well. Um, thankfully, uh, my family and I and and everyone um, at, at Genesis um, and I believe DCG broadly um, are all healthy um, and doing well. And so uh, we are certainly uh, fortunate to be in the position that we are, with uh, lots of thoughts and prayers going out to people out there that haven't been faring as well. Yeah, we definitely are uh, thinking about those people who are on the front lines of the virus and those who are infected. I guess the first place I'd want to start is we've been talking to a lot of traders this week, but you guys are unique in as much as you're you're regulated by uh, FINRA as a broker and based here in the U.S. So I think that'll offer a unique perspective versus, you know, we talked to B2C2, which is UK based. So different sort of regulatory setup, different type of counterparties. We spoke with Bobby Cho, similarly uh, different in as much as he's trading his own private capital. um, So not registered in the same way. I guess the first question is, what was that Black Thursday like? Um, If we can sort of rewind the clock, I'd be interested to hear what it looked like at Genesis as sort of Bitcoin saw one of its most dramatic declines in recent history. Um, yeah, did, actually, did something happen that week? I, I've heard something about it. Um, yeah, right. If you uh, <laughs> if you recall, um, and, and and my memory, um, if, if it serves me correctly, um, the first thing we actually sort of noticed had nothing to do with with, with the kind of the crypto market. Um, was the uh, the oil situation um, that popped up on that Sunday? I want to say, yeah, um, kind of leading up into that week, the Russia, the Saudi Arabia, uh, the oil situation, and kind of leading up into Monday morning, and oil sold off like thirty percent or something on on that Monday, and the uh, the equity markets um, sort of followed thereafter. For, for us, you know, we've been in the, the cryptocurrency space for now, this is our, our eighth year, I believe. And we've seen little pockets kind of here and there of what happens when kind of the, the broader markets um, sell off um, and how volatility in, in other markets in times of extreme distress and how that uh, potentially reverberates in, into the cryptocurrency market. And so our um, sort of our antennas sort of went up, leave, even leading up to, you know, kind of that Monday, Tuesday time frame. And then the, uh, the, the Thursday, um, which actually I believe happened to be our last day in the office um, before we decided to implement a, a work from home. We uh, obviously the the markets sold off. What tends to happen, the first leg is kind of the, the sellers come out um, on the OTC side. So, so we saw a tremendous amount of trading 
on the trading side for the Genesis uh, OTC business. And I'm sure the experience is very much kind of the same, but what tends to happen in, um, in, in those drawdown days is that everyone is trading in the same direction and, and, and not wanting to, to catch the falling knife. The exchange liquidity dries up because everyone's putting on the, the same trade. And then the bid asks on the OTC side also widen out or they just stop quoting altogether. Um, and so in, a, in that scenario where the spot price is falling, not just kind of falling at the velocity at which it was falling, certainly made it um, a challenging day for us on the, the, the trading side, looking to still help our clients execute and answering the phones and, and, and kind of walking the clients kind of through what was everything that was going on. Um, at the same time, trying to, to, you know, to make sure that our risk management systems were in place um, and, and making sure that uh, we were hedged on everything we were doing. So it is an all hands on deck situation, certainly even just the trading side. Um, as you might imagine, um, on the lending side, the first thing we start thinking about is is collateral and whether or not um, we have ample collateral to um, uh, kind of backing backing the loans. Um, and what tends to happen um, in, in in a situation like that is you make a margin call, you get the collateral, um, and then you end up uh, you know just whatever half an hour later um, margin calling the very same client a second time. And, uh, and just kind of managing the liquidity expectations as kind of the market dynamics were changing really quickly. Um, and because our clients are very institutional, um, very professional, um, and, and have a history of, of operating, not just in crypto, uh, but in other markets, um, the change in strategy that they were starting to, to implement as a result of the drawdown was extremely interesting for us to watch. And, and I'm happy to, to kind of get into it a little bit on this podcast. Yeah, that would definitely be interesting. But before we dive into that, I just want to take a step back to how you guys saw the decline coming in a sense or, or how you anticipated that um, leading up literally up until the 12th, right? Crypto markets compared to equities were pretty calm. That that oil event that you talked about, um, which really led to some some serious panic selling, um, you know, ha- was tied to that breakdown in conversations between OPEC and, and Russia on cutting crude output. That event, what happened in stocks, what connection did you see in the crypto market that made you guys think that you had to sort of start preparing for similar action in crypto and how do you prepare for a downturn like that as a OTC firm? So um, a little bit of, of my career background, I started on Wall Street at Citigroup on the investment banking side. Um, and so I was there through 2008. I kind of saw the, 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 as we were leading up into the great financial crisis um, in, in middle to late 2007 and saw, you know, firsthand what can happen in times of severe market distress. And I don't want to, um, to seem like I knew um, that the crypto market would certainly get hit and, and, and the magnitude of the move on that day, uh, on that Thursday. But what we have seen certainly is that in times of great distress, correlation goes to one um, across everything. And if you don't have an asset bolted down, you know, everything must go type of situation. And so you saw scenarios in which every market under the sun, you know, effectively sold off Um, and not just kind of in in, in equities kind of across the various um, market cap levels, but you know, bonds sold off, gold sold off, and everyone was just going to cash. And in that scenario, I didn't think that, you know, um, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin would be, would be immune in that um, level of, of severe distress. And so I think we were certainly um, more heightened awareness to volatility that was coming down the pipeline. And, uh, and, and so when it did happen, it wasn't a, um, a complete caught us off guard type of type of a scenario, um, having kind of lived in kind of the, the, the previous um, the, the financial crisis of, of 2007, 2008. 
So that makes a lot of sense. How do you, I've been kind of asking everyone about the work from home setup. I find it interesting. I hope the folks at home also find it interesting as a FINRA regulated broker, right? There are certainly things that you can do remotely or can't do remotely. When did you guys sort of go remote and what has that looked like from a logistical perspective? Is it harder to execute on certain trades? Is it involving more of a high touch involvement in the way you engage with different counterparties? How has work from home impacted the business, especially on a day like March 12th? Sure. Um, So uh, March 12th, we were actually still in the office. So in a way, we, you know, you could argue that we we lucked out in that um, we were still um, at at our headquarters. And so we were able to sort of, you know, it wasn't, it clearly wasn't business as, as usual, but the coordination of working from home, that, that wasn't a factor for, for Genesis on that particular day. Now, in the aftermath of, of March 12th, so that Friday, um, March 13th, was um, what was, I think, our last day in the office. And uh, we said, um, so what, what we've been doing kind of in, in after that is every single employee is, is obviously, um, you know, either in their home in, in New York or New Jersey, or some people have actually flown home, um, kind of left New York as they sort of thought that New York was, you know, was, and they were correct, uh, potentially one of the, the epicenters of the COVID-19 outbreak. What's been apparent to all of us is just the absolute importance of communication. And, um, What we have are basically just an open voice chat line between the traders, the the settlement folks, as well as different channels out to risk. The lending guys have their own chat and it's just on uh, on a 24-7 basis so that you don't really have to ping somebody to uh, to kind of get a conversation going. What about compliance? Um, What does that look like in this environment? Are there new parameters you need to set up? for compliance in this distributed work setup? Um, Not so much kind of on the the broker-dealer SEC FINRA side, um, simply because our digital currency activities sort of fall outside of kind of the securities business. FINRA and the SEC um, typically oversee. But like our compliance team is is in constant contact with the SEC and FINRA. What's interesting to us is that as equities market um, experienced the volatility kind of during that week, which led to you know the the, the crypto market um, also feeling it. Um, we actually got a call from FINRA asking how we were doing, and 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 so hey, I saw Bitcoin is being very volatile. Um, how are you guys holding up as a business? And which is interesting um, that they were checking up on member firms um, just to make sure that we were doing okay. Um, we obviously were able to, to put our, our, our Finder coordinator at ease, that everything was normal. Um, and, uh, you know, that volatility in, in the cryptocurrency asset class is, is not new. What type of things were they looking for, you think? I think, the, I mean, the, first and foremost, I think the SEC and Fenris wants them to make sure that the net capital for any broker dealer remains intact. And um, one of the things that, that we don't do is custody third party assets. And so every asset that sits on the, the, the balance sheet of, of Genesis, um, the, the broker dealer, is, is our own capital. So they really want to make sure, obviously, that there's no customer funds at risk um, and that the cryptocurrency volatility doesn't impact safeguarding of, of customer assets kind of in that regard. And so um, that's kind of the, the, the first and foremost concern that our broker dealer regulators tend to have. It's interesting. Um, well, so you guys have been trading Bitcoin. Well, technically, in 2014, you guys started experimenting with, with trading Bitcoin from it was 2013, Apple, 2013, right? Yeah. Okay, so we're we're talking, you know, numerous cycles, but no cycle during which we also had coupled a very dramatic, you know, fallout in U.S. equities, while at the same time having an ongoing health crisis. So, 
from Bitcoin's perspective, what has surprised you about this cycle versus other ones? Obviously, keeping in mind that you have all these ongoing factors with the financial and health crisis at the same time. Are you surprised by how it's acting? Is there something you would have expected that isn't playing out? Um, it's, it's funny. I think it's, it's probably a little too early to kind of assess the, the real damage um, to the extent that there are any. I'm a little bit surprised and, and frankly impressed um, that we haven't seen or heard of more stories of, of companies um, not doing well. Um, away from from folks that are, I, I would imagine, um, uh, actively fundraising, um, I would imagine that that's probably a, a stress point um, for for any company, crypto or otherwise, in this environment. But I really haven't heard too many stories of funds um, having to kind of go under um, in in the stress scenario. Certainly, there's been a, there's been a few, but um, much fewer than than I would have expected. And frankly, I think you hear a lot more stories about how companies are thriving um, and, and doing really, really well, you know, in, in, in the current environment. And so in, in a way, that's been a surprise. And um, we found ourselves certainly more heightened. Um, many of our borrowing and lending clients are pure crypto guys. And um, having survived kind of the, 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 the 2018, you know, 90 percent drawdown of the crypto market, um, the volatility, um, I imagine, is kind of is not new to them. Um, and so, you know, we always kind of think that, yes, they should be able to manage through it. Obviously, the, the velocity of the move certainly was notable in this one. What we found ourselves trying to think through is, you know, businesses um, that we lend to who have an equity trading business or they're in the commodity space, um, in addition to, to the crypto, mar- uh, crypto um, currency space, and trying to think through, okay, are they used to this level of shock? And, you know, what is really at risk? Um, we tend to think of companies that have other business lines as being stronger in a way, um, being that they're hedged kind of outside of, of the crypto space. Um, but what it does kind of introduce is, but are there risks that the crypto guys don't have to worry about, but these bigger trading firms have to simply because they have an existing business line in it. And uh, what we've obviously learned is, you know, um, if, if Lehman can fail, so can so can anyone. Um, and um, so we found ourselves paying a lot more attention, actually, to companies um, that are not just pure crypto only plays, but have other um, existing business lines and other financial asset classes. We have seen a few uh, companies um, kind of go out during this during this drawdown. Um, we, we reported on Adaptive Capital. There was another firm in the UK that Coindesk reported this morning, Cambrial. It was a small fun to fun adaptive was a little bit bigger, but I guess the impression I'm getting from you is at least at this point, you're right. It's, it's early. Um, there hasn't been that big of a shaking out. I mean, when you think about the firms you engage with the counterparties you have, most are still chugging along and maybe, uh, we reported on this when you juxtapose the returns that we see in equities. I mean, from D Shaw to, Bridgewater, a lot of these guys are getting hammered relative to crypto funds, which I've seen some of the returns. I haven't seen the end of March yet. That, that'll be a good month to dig into, but at least for January, February, and a few firms in March, holding up pretty well. So I think that that speaks to your point. I wonder though, down the line, and this is kind of tangential to the OTC market, um, and, and you should be able to speak to this just because you would be a buyer of some of these services. But if this economic crisis is prolonged, then you might see some fire sales or some service providers who can't find a big enough addressable market um, or the market is already so crowded. Those folks, three, six months from now, might have to close up shop or find themselves a buyer. But at this point, it, it might be a little too early to tell or say. 
Yeah, I think that's probably right. I mean, for for some of the the larger, um, you know, the the, the bigger funds and in, in the equities and in commodities space. Um, or, or in the fixed income space. I mean, those investors are kind of hoping for the the, the, the five, six, seven, eight percent a year type of return, right? And so they would be far more sensitive to this market drawdown um, than the crypto guys who understand the risk reward profile and kind of the volatility that uh, that frankly kind of comes with it. Um, these days, I mean, the, the U.S. Treasury market has higher volatility than crypto. Um, and so when it's just, you know, from a risk and allocation perspective, I would imagine that volatility in some of the, the, the larger asset classes, investors are going to be far more sensitive to, um, than, than the, 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 the crypto guys, um, as far as potential redemptions and, and, and then the data that you mentioned will sort of come out hopefully, um, relatively, relatively quickly. Now to your other point, um, you know, Companies, service providers that are um, still on the startup B stage, um, that are still looking to to, to find their niche um, within the, the crypto asset class and kind of build their customers. Certainly, um, the the price action that got us down to whatever the high three thousands, and, and here we are hovering around nearly seven k. I think this morning um, is going to kind of impact their business, and I'm sure some people will have to, uh, to, you know, close up their doors or seek to be acquired. But um, I think that'll probably play out more, um, you know, within the next uh, month or two. And the happening is, is obviously going to come into play pretty soon. Um, we've talked about this in the past about the level Bitcoin needs to be at for uh, many of the miners out there to be profitable. They could be part of that checking out if we see, further declines in Bitcoin's price since they're so uh, reliant on that as a, a source of revenue. What what do you anticipate the range for that to be, for them to be in relatively good shape? Um, I mean, uh, we, I mean, when you and I last spoke on this particular topic, um, we, the, the Bitcoin price needed to be about 6,500 for kind of the average miner to, to break even. And those with kind of the newer machines and had cheaper electricity, the number was a little bit less. Those with older guys, um, a little bit more, um, but kind of 6,500 uh, on average. Now, you know, the, the factors are certainly different. Um, now, we just had the, uh, the second largest, I think, difficulty adjustment in the history of Bitcoin. Um, and so the math kind of changes um, at that level. But at the same time, the happening is much bigger impact um, than the, the difficulty adjustment that we ultimately saw. Um, I do expect that um, folks that are running the oldest machines, um, they'll effectively be, the machines themselves will become worthless pretty quickly if, if, if it's not done um, there already. Um, and that they would need to upgrade to the uh, to, to the newest um, best um, equipment very very quickly to gain any sense of efficiency in the post halving environment. So it's it's really a matter of um, how much dry powder do they have? Are they able to finance the purchase of the new equipment? That'll ultimately decide whether or not um, these miners are able to survive. Now, what I do expect, though, at some level is, is, is a consolidation amongst miners, not just because folks um, dropping out um, of kind of the, the mining game as it becomes, you know, um, way unprofitable for them to participate. But the guys with the, the most dry powder um, being able to buy the best new mining equipment in, in the space, um, just taking market share as a result of, 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 of the halvening as well as the, the, of the Bitcoin price environment. If you're a listener of The Scoop or follow The Block, then you know I am super excited about the future of crypto adoption, especially on the enterprise side. Our sponsor, Blockset, is not only helping to push development at the grassroots level with their multi-chain API, but also at the institutional level. Blockset is built by BRD, the first crypto wallet in the App Store from 2014, and one of the largest in the space today. 
They've taken the architecture and the knowledge they've gained over the past six years to create Blockset, a robust, reliable, and strategic B2B offering for developers and enterprises. Blockset is enabling banks and other major financial institutions to interface and build with crypto assets at light speed. See just how simple it is by visiting Blockset.com and sign up for a free account today. Since Moro was last on the show, we've seen a few new participants enter the lending space from, you, you know, blockchain.com has got in um, as one recent example. And as more and more players enter the fold, Bitco, another recent example, more questions are, are raising about whether or not there is this credit bubble, which would be probably more relevant during a crisis um, than any other time. So I guess that's one place to start. Ryan, if you want to add to that, feel free, but yeah, definitely. I think um, one of the, one of the bigger things that stuck with me from our last conversation, Michael uh, on the scoop was this idea of Genesis not operating in a vacuum and competition for originations continued to swell throughout 2019, both from, custodial lending side, but also, you know, the new entrance from the non-custodial open finance, decentralized finance lending space, those types of facilities. Um, one thing in particular you pointed out was that you were starting to see new entrants kind of dip a bit below the credit box, offer sweeter introductory rates, maybe lower collateral ratios um, to try and, and, and grab share. I'm wondering if you've seen some of that unwind um, or the past couple of months, or just kind of the impacts of, of some of that activity from last year. And to Frank's point, yeah, how how is this uh, this competitive environment impacting the so-called credit bubble that we've, we're hearing more people talk about within crypto lending? You're right. Certainly, there's been um, new entrants in, into the lending market, um, and I'm sure we'll continue to kind of see it for some time. As, um, as companies that are either just kind of a monoline in, in the lending space, um, as well as um, companies that have other business lines, look to find additional sources of revenue. What, um, and and I'll, this is probably, um, it makes sense kind of in light of the, the current market dynamics. And so backing up a little bit, um, the typical scenario in which our counterparties were utilizing um, uh, crypto borrow um, and U.S. dollar borrow, frankly, um, in the January February timeframe, um, was to effectively um, take advantage of the arbitrage opportunities between the spot market and the futures market, um, because futures market was trading at a premium. Folks would um, buy the uh, borrow dollars and buy the spot market. Um, and then sell the futures, um, and in many cases, wait till expiry um, and collect the, the spread um, as an arbitrage strategy. March 12th, um, 13th happened, and that market flipped. And what you saw in that flip was going from the futures market at a premium to a futures market at a discount, and in many ways, at a good discount to the spot market. And what happened at that point um, was kind of the biggest deleveraging that we've we've ever seen, obviously, kind of since we started our business a couple of years ago, um, where because the basis um, spread collapsed, that went away. And it, in fact, it kind of went in the opposite direction where folks are um, now saying, OK, I want to return the dollars I borrowed from you um, and borrow Bitcoin instead. So now Bitcoin spot market was trading at a premium to the futures market. So there's any other way they were short the spot market, buy the futures, um, and then wait till expiry and kind of collect the spread um, at, at expiry. The level at which the dollars were coming in and the Bitcoins were going out the door was the largest that we've ever seen. On top of that, we also had um, counterparties who were leveraged long Bitcoin and um, what happens kind of in that environment, obviously, is, is folks are taking that leverage off um, and now returning again, returning dollars um, and getting their, their Bitcoin collateral back out to them. 
Um, and so it was a combination of a couple of different things in addition to a, um, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain also being really congested that made kind of moving coins around um, a, a challenge kind of in those, in those couple of days. Um, in the aftermath, we decided as a firm to say, hey, let's hit pause on credit. Um, let's not extend any credit. And, um, and, and so that was a, a firm wide um, decision that, that we had made in conversations with our risk department, um, and as well as for me, that it was okay to hit pause. Um, and in my personal view, um, you know, this was, Hey, this COVID-19 thing looks real, um, and significant. The equities market is melting. The, um, the oil market's melting. The fixed income market is, is volatile. And you hear commercial paper, um, isn't rolling over. Um, so the credit market is dislocated, and um, how could I get comfortable extending credit in that environment? And for us, if what was happening in the other markets didn't cause just a repricing of risk generally, then like what event could possibly cause such a thing? And so we said, okay, let's just let's just stop. Let's stop um, uh, on the credit side. And, and see how the dust settles and, 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 and you know, wait a couple of weeks, wait a month, however long it might take for us to, to kind of better sense for where the market is and then kind of reassess. That's a pretty big deal. Crypto's largest lending desk hitting pause on credit. What's the timeline? What do you want to see in the market for you to dive back in? So um, I'll tie this into your earlier conversation about competition. Um, so there are certainly instances in which um, uh, somebody would come to us and say, hey, so-and-so is, is lending us this at this term um, and can, can Genesis match it or, or do better or any of those situations. And we said, hey, let that trade away. You know, the, the, the risk, we couldn't quantify it. We couldn't kind of get our arms around how bad things were really ultimately kind of get. And, um, and so, you know, comp- normally we'd obviously be looking to compete and, and, and see whether we can ultimately kind of get there. But, you know, for about two weeks, um, we said, hey, let's, let's let, let the other guys take that risk. That, that's something that I, I didn't want that I didn't feel comfortable owning at, at that point in time. We just had a story go out on Figure, which uh, is a popular uh, blockchain-based lender um, that hit the brakes on its HELOC origination, uh, home equity lines and credit loans. And it was a similar type of story. Uh, we, we got on the phone with Cagney, and, and he has really deep market structure expertise, and his point was, look, I have money on my balance sheet to, to do these loans. We could we could do these loans. There's investor or rather customer appetite for HELOCs. But I just don't know how to price these things because there's no sense of accurate pricing right now in the market, in the ABS market at, at that point of time. So I, I think this is a trend that's unfolding across all markets, right? It's not just you guys, but I'd be interested to sort of dive a little bit deeper into this. What, what were some of the specific things that competitors were able to do that you couldn't? Um, Basically the idea that um, loan terms that were in place before all of this, call it late February, early March, was still valid in this environment um, was just something we just couldn't, we couldn't get there. And, um, you know, I don't want to really kind of get into specifics, but it'll be around collateral. It wasn't even much, uh, there was a little bit of an interest rate conversation from time to time, but it was mostly about collateral. And, how we were saying, hey, um, we need you guys to fully collateralize or over collateralize. And while other lenders were, were happily giving out loans at a significantly kind of reduced 
collateral rates. And then great. If they can get there from a risk reward perspective, you know, that's fine. Um, but it was just not a risk that, um, that, that Genesis was, was kind of willing to own until we saw, you know, um, the, the market kind of calming down as a whole. Michael, so would you say that in general, uh, given the deleveraging phase that you described that occurred this past month and just the fact that Genesis has hit pause on credit for the time being, where can funds go for leverage then? I mean, we've seen Frank had a great scoop a couple of weeks ago that Adaptive Capital had a massive unwind and they kind of pointed fingers at BitMEX as part of a reason. Are there really no opportunities right now for funds to get leverage in size that they can trust? Um, you know, I can only speak to kind of what we're doing. Um, I don't um, have a good sense for for what um, other parties are doing, whether that's kind of in the, the lending space or they're an exchange operator um, offering margin to kind of their clients. But, you know, for, for us, you know, over the last probably three to four days, we are starting to at least be open to having conversations on credit. Um, so I wouldn't say that today, sitting here on, uh, on April 3rd, that um, we are not extending any credit, but it's really kind of on a, on a case-by-case basis and, and client-by-client conversation. And we're certainly not, you know, at the, the leverage levels um, that we've been at previously. Um, whereas in the last, you know, uh, call it 10 days to, to two weeks, we weren't even really entertaining any kind of conversation about it. Um, we are um, having kind of select conversations with, with certain counterparties as we um, kind of dip our toe back in the water a little bit. And so I'm hopeful um, that it was just a, a couple of week thing. And uh, but I'm still I'm not an overall kind of market expert, but I'm not calling a bottom here on any of these asset classes. And, and so um, I do um, want to be smart and prudent about the level of leverage we give and to whom. Well, it's definitely rare to see uh, that level of conservatism in this market, which is known for, I think, to most of the outside world, 100x leverage and Lamborghinis and all of that sort of exorbitance um, that that's sort of memed about. But I think that's a really interesting place to leave things off. Once you guys start getting back into action, we'll have to have you come back on to run through what that was like and how you sort of dove back into the market for that. Um, but we appreciate you coming on during these interesting, interesting times across all markets. Michael Morrow. CEO of Genesis Global Trading. Thanks so much. Thank you, guys. Enjoyed the conversation. And be safe. This podcast is about pushing awareness and inspiring growth in the crypto industry. I can't reiterate enough that if you're a business owner, executive, or active developer in the space, I highly suggest checking out Blockset. Blockset provides a robust, unified API that provides easy access to multi-chain data. Skip the tedious data normalization process and start building immediately at a fraction of the cost. It's live now and it's on their site for you to explore. Go sign up for a free account at blockset.com and start building today.